toxins have the power to ruin perfectly good things, and I think this happens more frequently than we would like. Every once in a while, we hear reports of nasty chemicals getting into drinking water or into fruits and vegetables and other food staples. And if consumed, people can get seriously ill or, or worse. In some cases, people die from it. Now, toxins should be uh, avoided because they are harmful to us. And they can even get into our religion. Though it's not chemicals, it's more like beliefs and behaviors. Now, this makes for a, a toxic faith. And a toxic faith is dangerous because it leads people to act in destructive ways and in ways that turn people off from the ministry that the church has to offer. Now, most of us can probably picture in our minds a number of different beliefs and behaviors that can turn religion into something toxic. Now, gossip and hatred do the job pretty well, but so do lots of other things, including being self-righteous, and acting judgmental. Jesus tells a, a parable about this very thing. He tells a story about a religious person who is struggling with, with being self, self-righteous and judgmental. And yet that person doesn't even know he has a problem. Now Jesus tells us in this story that one day two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. Seeing people praying at the temple was a common sight in the first century. Quite often, people would go there to pray privately at any time of the day. They would pray for family or friends or for their jobs or anything that was going on in their lives. People would also go to the temple to pray for corporate, in corporate prayer, which happened three times a day. Now, it's not clear if the Pharisee and the tax collector were at the temple for corporate prayer or if they were there on their own and just happened to be there at the same time. But, of course, they are there for the same reason. They're there to pray. And yet, when they pray, they approach God in completely different ways. When the Pharisee prays, he steps away from the crowd in order to maintain his purity before God and then he rattles off a a long list of all his religious accomplishments he says God I thank you that I'm not like other people thieves rogues adulterers or even like this tax collector and then he goes on to say I fast twice a week I give away a tenth of all my income he is proud of the fact That he does everything right by obeying all the religious rules. And in terms of keeping God's commandments, he is well above the average. And then there's the tax collector. When the tax collector prays, he bows his head, beats his breast, and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now he's so ashamed that he can't even lift his hands up and look towards the heavens as people would commonly pray in the first century. He doesn't boast about any of his accomplishments and he doesn't make up any excuses for his behavior either. All he does is ask for God's mercy. Now as we study this passage, I would caution us to not make any assumptions about either the Pharisee or the tax collector. And one assumption that we may want to make is that one person is good and the other is bad. Now, in Jesus' day, people would have assumed that the Pharisee was a goody two-shoes who never did anything wrong and that the tax collector was as dirty as they come. But the Scripture doesn't make those kinds of statements about either one. Of course, the Pharisee did lots of good things. He takes his faith seriously. He fasts. He gives away a tenth of his income. But as we saw in the scripture reading, he also has a attitude problem. He thinks he's better than other people. 
And then there's the tax collector. He certainly did a lot of bad things. We know from historical records that tax collectors were abusive. And they used a variety of unjust practices to get their work done. They were known for behaving badly. They were known for behaving in ways that are contrary to the ways of God. And yet, this tax collector prays for God's mercy as he confesses his sin. He recognizes the toxic things in his life. So rather than saying one is good and one is bad, I think we're better off recognizing that they both do good things and they both do bad things. And the bad things can be toxic to their faith. In fact, we see two characteristics in this story that create a toxic faith. And these are things that disciples of Jesus should attempt to avoid. But unfortunately, these two traits have a way of popping up in our lives if we're not diligent in resisting them. Now, the first characteristic is self-righteousness. This is identified at the beginning of the scripture reading from Luke. And Luke tells us that Jesus' parable was addressed to those people that trusted that they were righteous. And as Jesus tells this story we see that the Pharisee felt superior to all other people around him, especially those sinners that he named, thieves, adulterers, and tax collectors. And then when the Pharisee comes to the temple to pray, we know what his prayer was like, but he essentially was saying, Lord, I thank you that I'm better than everyone else. It's an arrogant prayer. It's a self-righteous prayer. He believes that he is superior from everyone else. And it's that kind of attitude that will infect and contaminate a perfectly good faith. Now a second characteristic of a toxic faith that we see in this scripture passage is a judgmental spirit. In the opening words of our passage, Luke speaks of people who look down on everybody else. That's the crowd that had gathered to hear Jesus teach. Now these people regarded others with contempt as it says in the scripture. And the Pharisee embodies this. He looked down on a bunch of different people including that tax collector. And that tax collector had simply come to the temple seeking God's presence. Seeking God's mercy. Now judging others will contaminate a good faith. And sadly, there are many Christians who seem to live with a condemning and judgmental spirit. This is destructive because it it turns people off from the good things that the church has to offer. And different studies have shown that one of the main reasons unchurched people avoid going to church is that they feel it's a judgmental place. Now, this scripture from Luke teaches us that disciples avoid judging other people. And instead of judging, we ought to just leave that to God. That's God's work. And and that certainly is one of the major themes that we see in Jesus' ministry. He constantly told his disciples to avoid doing this. And a good example of it can be found in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus has this to say. He says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your your own eye while the log is in your own? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Jesus is teaching us that being judgmental has no place in the life of a disciple. Instead of looking down on others and acting arrogant and self-righteous, Jesus calls us to live with humility 
He wants us to act more like the tax collector who saw himself as a sinner. And he prayed for God's mercy. And in the end, Jesus says the tax collector went down to his home justified. And then Jesus drives home this message by saying, For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The tax collector saw what was toxic in his own life, and he worked to change things. He restored his relationship with God by asking for forgiveness, while the Pharisee moved further away from God by boasting of his own righteousness. This parable reminds us that we all need to give careful attention to the way we live and to not overlook the little things. If we don't do this, minor mistakes and little attitudes can get out of control. They can become toxic to our faith and even to our relationships. And this is what being judgmental can do. Now, I think there's several steps that we can take to avoid living with a self-righteous and judgmental spirit. And the first thing we can do is to look for the image of God in other people. Now, if you go to the state fair in a couple weeks, you'll see all kinds of people there. People of different skin colors, people with different hairstyles, different sense of fashion, and so forth. Some of these differences may cause you to take a step back and think that you don't want to associate with them. But these differences are all superficial. These differences really don't reflect the true nature of a person. The truth about a crowd of people is that they are all children of God. They're all created in the image and the likeness of God. And that's what we ought to be looking for. Instead of judging people, try to see God and God's spirit in them. Another important thing that we can do is to be intentional and sharing grace and mercy with others. Now, I think we sometimes are, are, are quick to judge others and are pretty gentle on ourselves. Think of the times when you've been in a line in the store, and when you finally get up to, to the cashier, the clerk messes up your purchase in some way and has to call the store manager, and that only takes a lot more time. You can feel your blood pressure rising, can't you? And then when you finally start talking to the, the cashier, you say, can't you get this right? Now, we can be quick to judge others, but slow to judge ourselves. We go easy on ourselves. We give ourselves grace because we know how hard it is to work and do our jobs when we're tired or we're sick or we're preoccupied with some sort of personal problem that's going on in our lives. But we may not extend that same grace to the store clerk. All we see in that person is what's wrong. And in that sense, we act like the Pharisee in the parable. Now, one other important step that we can take to avoid self-righteous and judgmental behavior is to pray and to confess our own sins. Now, I think one way to do this is to measure ourselves against the seven deadly sins. You know what those seven are. It's lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. That's a pretty comprehensive list of sins. And I think as we look at that list and compare ourselves to it, we can see where we actually struggle. And as we see where we struggle, we can then begin to acknowledge our own sins and the toxic things in our lives. And that helps us realize that we need forgiveness as much as anybody else. And that equips us to be more empathetic. And when we're more empathetic we're less likely to judge. Now, judging others is destructive. It's a a destructive force in our lives and in our faith. And so we need to resist it. And I want to encourage you to, to keep this in your prayers and try your very best to, to see other people for who they are, not who you think they are. 
Next time you're in a store waiting in a long line, try to engage the store clerk. Now, you don't have to invite them to coffee or anything like that. But just, just look at that person's face. And remember that that person exists outside of that store. That clerk is somebody's daughter, maybe somebody's wife. Perhaps she's a mother. She has a home that she returns to every day, a kitchen where she prepares her meals, a bed that she sleeps in every night, and occasionally wrestles with her own demons. When she finishes ringing you up, just look her in the eyes. Don't judge her. Just see her for who she is, not who you think she is. Resist that urge to judge because that won't do anyone any good. All it does is infect and contaminate you and your faith. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, you are all powerful and forgiving and we thank you for that gift and we pray that you would have mercy on us in our times of sin in those times when we act self-righteous and judgmental we pray that you would forgive us and that you would shower us with the blessings of your guidance and grace strengthen us to move forward in life by living with joy and gratitude and mercy and grace so that others may share in the blessings that you offer Use us, Lord, to share good news with our world, the good news of Jesus Christ, who forgives all and loves all. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. In just a moment, we'll sing our hymn of invitation. It's hymn number 390. As we sing, I'll be standing at the front of the sanctuary. If you would like to receive prayer, I'm happy to pray with you during this time. Or if you have a decision that you would like to share with our church family, I invite you to come and share that news with us. It is a, a time to make decisions about faith and following Jesus or even uniting with the church in membership. But let's stand now and sing together hymn number 390, We Are Called to Be God's People. <laughs>